Ladies and gentlemen, Damas and Hera, Gogos and Goginas, please welcome to the stage the one, the only, the rock star of the innovative inno organization, Martin. Thank you so much for your kind words. I'm a bit confused because I think you just, I heard you say you had 20 minutes, but I thought I had 40 minutes. So, okay, 40 minutes. So, let me clarify that. So, ladies and gentlemen, who of you is using a computer more than three hours on a single day? Okay. So, you're all knowledge workers, and that's okay, that's fine. But there's a funny thing that we see at big corporates, but governments as well. Uh, most of the people use a computer as a modern typewriter. Well, a computer is not a typewriter. It's something more sophisticated. And the dynamics of computing power uh, that will unfold in the upcoming 40 minutes will dramatically change your business or even the existence of your business. Who of you thinks that he's in the finance business? <laughs> oh, a few. I think the branch finance itself will not exist in 10 or maybe 15 years because then it's all computerized and automate it. So that's good news because you're the lucky ones who hear it in advantage. So you have 10 or maybe 15 years ahead to change your strategy. Well, I'm an explorer of the network and information age. I've been doing this uh, for, for 15, 20 years. I never had a job in my entire life. I never uh, 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 had a proper education. I do master classes, although. And uh, I was a businessman when I was 15. And then when I was 19, I had 140 people working for me, running two companies without internet and without mobile phones because they didn't exist at that time. So I have a deep obsession on organizing mechanisms, how to accomplish stuff. And as I grew older and as technology evolved, I become better and became better in Okay, what does this technology mean on a large scale on, in affecting stuff, changing stuff, uh, solving problems, creating opportunities, you're going after real big challenges. And I think on this continent, you have some challenges. So, how to deal with that? Well, I want to talk to you about what I call the new renaissance. In Europe, we had the dark ages, and in the dark ages, not a lot of, not of innovation was happening, not of, uh, enough learning was happening, and then in the city of Florence in Italy, we had the Renaissance, and also the first banker's family in the world, the Medici's, and uh, they invested heavily in arts and stuff like that, and in this Renaissance, uh, something interesting happened. We had an explosion of ideas and innovation because of the confluence of all kinds of fields all kinds of religions, philosophical streams, insights came together. And the best solution in any field always comes from another field. So that led to an explosion of ideas. And it's my belief that since the last 10 years, we're again in, an, in a renaissance, a new renaissance, a period of time with tremendous confluence of all kinds of stuff because of the web. Well, there are people who's, who think this age is about the same period of time less at the invention of the steam machine that brought us a lot of wealth. But actually, it's not. The steam machine was in the hands of 0.1%, or maybe even less, of the population. The stuff that I will talk about will be in the hands of 2 million, a billion people at this moment and 4 billion people in the upcoming 10 years. So the amount of innovation and the amount of disruption that we will encounter in the upcoming 10 years is never seen before. And I think it's the best news for Africa. I think uh, this continent has one of the best hands in dealing with this future. But I have to clarify that first. I think the new Renaissance contains two streams coming together. It's the network age and the information age together at the same time. What does that mean? Well, the first guy who bought a fax machine couldn't do anything with it. <laughs> and after a second guy bought a fax machine, they could send faxes uh, over, and, uh, over and over. <laughs> but that's interesting. You buy something, but because someone else buys something as well, it creates value to the stuff that you already bought. You're all into networking, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But a lot of people that I met, especially in businesses, they never studied network dynamics or network effects. And you should do, because network effects, I think, are one of the main drivers in what's happening nowadays in the upcoming future. So there's this law called Metcalfe's Law that says that every node that you add to a network 
creates a, a, a tremendous extra possibilities of interconnection. And the more nodes in this interconnected network, the more dense the network becomes, the more possibilities there are. But there are not just people, or mobile phones, or fax machines that are becoming interconnected. We're at the, at the verge of, of not 4G networks, but 5G networks. So there will be not the Internet of Things, maybe you've heard about it, but the Internet of Everything. And it's only in the upcoming five years that that will happen. So everything will be connected with everything. This is one of the main drivers uh, uh, behind the developments that I will demo to you. And there's also the information age. Who of you uh, deals with something you might call information overload daily? <laughs> it's normal, don't worry, everybody has that. And that's funny. Last 10, 15 years, we got a lot of extra information. So the amount of information that we have to deal with it, notifications, reports, whatever, uh, we have to deal with that. But we are not trained to deal with all this information. Who of you knows what to do when you're at, uh, staring at the ocean and it's moving backwards? What to do? It depends how far, uh, really far. <laughs> Okay, then it's, it's a sign that there is a tsunami coming up. So, uh, um, common uh, logic says you have to run the other way, uh, hope you find a tree, you have to climb into it and, and uh, pray that it will uh, end well. But um, some people just grab a surfboard and think, okay, I know one thing for sure, an interesting wave will come up and that will be a hell of a ride. I'm a life hacker. A life hacker is like a productivity ninja, a knowledge ninja. Um, a life hacker is someone who every day is working on how to do more in less time, with less stress, at lower costs, with more impact. And a knowledge worker, uh, a knowledge ninja like a life hacker is every day figuring out, okay, where are the tools? I have to find new strategies to deal with everything. So the upcoming 10 years, there will be more and more information, and we cannot deal with that because nobody ever taught us that we had to filter information let alone nobody ever taught us how to filter information. And filtering information is one of the most important skills that all the people that work for you have to learn in the upcoming few years. So digital skills are not on the strategic agenda of boards and directors and HR. And that is silly, because the most scarce asset you have, all the people and their scarce time on this planet, you have to figure out a way to leverage that. Um, are there people here in the room who think that you, uh, that, that you have to protect information, that you have, your information needs to be secure and that, it's, that it will contain uh, uh, secure in the upcoming years? This is one of the in most interesting developments in information technology that I encountered uh, in the past years. At this moment, uh, scientists are figuring out how to store information in DNA. So DNA was one of the best solutions of nature itself to copy information and to preserve it for a long year, uh, time of year. At this moment, the storage capacity of one gram of biological DNA is the same as 500,000 DVDs full with uh, 7.9 gigabytes of data per CD. Okay, so can you imagine a lot of crates here, a lot of cubical meters with all just DVDs full with data? This all fits in one gram of DNA and you can make millions of copies of it in only one hour and it will last for a few hundred years. Good solution, eh? This is no science fiction. I mean, science fiction is now. This is an old story. This is not a new story. Maybe you've heard it for the first time, but this is an old story. So people with a lot of money and people also without money, experts and amateurs are together working on stuff like this. And the fun part of living in this age is that you can easily look them up on LinkedIn. You can say hi to them on Twitter. You can have a coffee with them to to try to explain what they're doing and working at. So already there are Shakespeare collections and DVD series like Homeland in DNA being copied every time. So all the information on Earth will be copyable biological. So it's good news, I think, for mankind. Maybe not good news for uh, your strategy, because I think you need a new strategy. But this is stuff that's happening every day. So information technology that is evolving rapidly and network technology and network effects. Together, they will form the new renaissance. Is there anyone here in the room who have heard of, have read even this book, Abundance, of Peter Diamandis? Very well. Uh, this is one of the most important books, I think, at the moment. It uh, was published a few years ago, and Abundance has the subtitle, The Future is Better Than You Think. 
Peter is the founder of the Singularity University. It's the university of uh, um, uh, Google and NASA, founded by Elon Musk and Larry Page. And they're studying the impacts of the confluence of exponential technologies and the impacts, therefore, on mankind from an economic perspective and from a societal perspective. At this moment, biotechnology, neurotechnology, nanotechnology, sensor technology, deep learning, artificial intelligence, predictive intelligence, 3D, 4D, DNA, uh, open source, open data, big data, open hardware, the maker movement, the uh, do-it-yourself movement, and social forums, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, are confugating all together. And if you don't know all those branches, don't worry. Why is this important? 30 years ago, when a neuroscientist would publish something in the medical uh, uh, magazine, uh, The Lancet, it was published half a year later. A few people would read it, maybe it would inspire a few people, but nothing came out of that. 20 years ago, when a neuroscientist and a nanoscientist would become drunk together in Harvard or Oxford, uh, nothing would happen again. Well, maybe two hangovers, but no big deal for mankind. But nowadays, those branches, those uh, uh, fields, are no loose silos anymore. They're all connected and interconnected. The best solution in any field always comes from another field. And now, because of the web, 1.4 billion people on Facebook, 300 million people on Twitter, 300 million people on LinkedIn, can share everything that's happening, amateurs and experts, with big budgets and without budget. And they're innovating in a rapid pace. Because of this, like Peter states in this book, I think within 20 years, technology is evolved that uh, fast that uh, solar power will be free. That's great news when you live on a continent with a lot of sun. This is a game changer. Solar power will be free within 15 or 20 years worldwide. So then you can uh, use the rising sea level, it's called salt water, uh, you can tr transform that into fresh water. You can already do that, but it costs you money because of the power. If power becomes free, you could create fresh water for everyone. So you could use it to get, away, get rid of the desert, you could grow vegetation, grow food, and you also have nice weather. So I think the perspective for Africa is Great, better than Europe, I guess. So I think I will move here. So um, to, for me, it's a fact, it's reality. And even if you think about the dynamics on a geopolitical level, when diamonds, gold, oil are abundant or, uh, or we have substitutes that even work better and are free. So this will change the entire dynamics of what's happening in, in your society and in the eco uh, economy. Well, it's funny, the economy used to be uh, the science where people are studying the effects of scarcity. But economists cannot deal with abundance. And abundance is happening in a lot of fields all at the same time right now. So, um, that's this book. It deals with society and economy. This book just was published uh, a few uh, uh, months ago by Salim Ismail and Yuri van Geest, a, good a very good friend of mine. And it's called it's building in the other book. So it's, uh, Salim works at the uh, uh, Singularity University as well. And it's saying why new organizations, and you all know them already, are 10 times better, cheaper, and faster than yours, and what you can do about it. So this book is about strategies, how to deal with all those, uh, <laughs> all those uh, disruptions. And uh, it's one of the highest rated books on Amazon ever. So that's interesting. So who of you here in this room is uh, insecure? Who is so insecure that you prefer not to share it with others? <laughs> okay, let me tell you, everyone on the planet is insecure somehow, and we all figure out how to deal with that. Uh, and because we're all insecure, especially in the banking industry, people love predict uh, predictability. We love to predict because then we're less insecure. Because if you can predict stuff, you think you're safe. It's not real safe, but okay, we love to think that we're safe. And this is why we cannot grasp the concept of exponentiality. So exponentiality is like the multipli uh, mul multiplication of the multiplication, times the multiplication. So if I would take 30 linear steps, like say one, two, three, we can all predict, well, it's about the other side of the wall, 30 steps. Is there any one of you who knows how far 30 exponential steps are? I mean, two times four, uh, two is four, times four is 16, times 16 is 256, times 
256 is 65,536, I memorized it. Uh, and then there comes another number that's even in the millions. 30 exponential steps is like 26 times around the world. So exponential effects, we see them in the computer world. I have a tiny computer. It's an open hardware, so, uh, hardware project. It's called Arduino. This is only 20 euros. I don't know how much rent that is, but very cheap. And this has more computing power than the big supercomputers that we used in the 60s to shoot people to the moon. It's because of Moore's law. Every 18 months, the, the amount of transistors on a chipset doubles while the price stays the same. And it's been happening for a very long period of time. So, exponential effects are starting and happening and doubling and doubling and doubling, but you don't see them because they're very tiny. And when you see them, <laughs> you're too late. And this is not happening in just uh, uh, the field of computing power, it's in DNA. DNA is evol uh, evolving uh, even faster. In any field that I just mentioned, we see exponential development. And they're all congregating and intertwining. So let's say that you have a record store in the 70s. Well, the internet was already there, called DARPANET, ARPANET, whatever. And somewhere here uh, you had more, uh, uh, more uh, uh, locations and more locations. Somewhere here you think, oh, Gee, that's cool, now we have DVDs. People bought the same music they already had on a new device, like a CD. So there was a lot of money, and then you went to IPO. You thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna have a real big market now, I'm gonna sell CDs. And here somebody tells you, look out, the internet is coming. And then we had the first internet bubble, everybody said, oh, great, I'm safe. And somewhere here we had 3G, mobile, 4G, Spotify, boom! Broke, you're out of business. This is what's happening to a lot of people who are selling CDs. That's not a problem, but I think we will see this in the upcoming 10 years in the world of insurance, pensions, banking, energy, pharmaceuticals. This will be normal. And once you discover it, you're too late. So you have to study what's happening here. And most of the corporates don't have a strategy how to find what's happening here and how to deal with it and how to play with it. We know Uber. Uber is like an exponential organization. Uber has nothing to do with taxis. If you think they're in the taxi business, they're not. They're in logistics. And there's, there's a, they are a deep learning, algorithm-driven, supply-demand friction player who are figuring out what they can move from one place to the other. So if you're DHL, TNT, whatever, you will be out of business because of Uber. Tesla is another one. And <laughs> Elon Musk is like Richard Branson of the 21st century. And this guy is totally nuts. Elon Musk is a very weird guy. And he said, OK, we want to uh, solve electrical uh, cars. OK, let's do that. Let's make Tesla. And then he did something very daring. He said, let's open source all of our knowledge. So he's sharing every knowledge they have on electrical cars and batteries. They're sharing it open source. Wall Street went berserk. Their investors became, uh, went, uh, went mad, but he said, yeah, I walk my talk. I really want to do something for the planet. And the more people use this knowledge, the more competitors I have, the faster we will solve uh, electrical cars. And we have to solve that. But <laughs> he was driving with his friend in the, in the desert of Nevada uh, in a very cool night under the stars. And his friend said, hey, Elon, why don't we go to the stars? And then Elon said, now you, he's very practical. That's too far away takes too long. Let's go to Mars. And the next day, Elon phoned uh, <laughs> the Russian army, like, hi, it's Elon. <coughs> he had a, bit, a little bit too much money after selling PayPal. Do you have still those old missiles? Yes. How much are they? Okay, great sold. So uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, built his own uh, space uh, uh, company, and he's now into space. And if you would have told me five years ago that the next big thing in doing business is space, I would have laughed. I thought, yeah, sure, space, like NASA, space shuttle, not my thing, big corporates, big institutions. But actually, space is rapidly becoming very cheap because of the con uh, conflagration of all these exponential technologies. So uh, I've been diving into this. What's happening here in this field? And um, I don't know who of you have read this last October, this news. There was a Dutchman, actually, who was running this project. We landed on a comet. We landed on a comet. That's very, very important news for mankind. 
especially for the people who are in the mining business. Is there anyone here with interest or stakes in the, in the mining industry? No? Okay, that's good news for you. Um, so, this is the first step. The next step is that we land on the right comet. And there are plenty of comets, uh, comets uh, in the universe, and uh, some of them contain gold, uh, uh, otherwise uh, uh, other uh, contain uh, the, um, stuff that, that is scarce on Earth. So we have to land on the right one, then we have to put rockets on it, and then we have to send it the right direction to Earth, then we call Bruce Willis, and he's blowing it up on the right spot, and then we... <laughs> All those parts of the asteroid land on the right spot on Earth, and then there's uh, abundance of all those stuff, and not, uh, not scarcity. And uh, I thought, well, yeah, that's a joke, yeah, this is not true. And then I dove into it, and I figured out that worldwide, people are already studying the impact of asteroid mining. It's already a million dollar business in the legal field, because space, uh, uh, space uh, advocacy and, and legal, is already a big market. Okay, who's that comet? Uh, who's the owner of that comet? And, and, and if somebody dies there, who's responsible? So, ten thousands of people on Earth already are studying the impact of asteroid mining, like iron, cobalt, manganese, uh, silver. And um, um, there's this game, Eve Online. You can learn a lot of uh, things from the gaming industry. And Eve Online is one of the biggest games, multiplayer games, on Earth. Every time IBM has a new supercomputer, they will test it on, on this game. At any given moment, 100,000 people are playing in the same field uh, in a game It's called EVE Online. And this game is only about the mining of asteroids, trading it, and moving around in virtual universes. The best econometrists on Earth don't work for a central bank, but they work for EVE Online. So the game dynamics and the algorithms behind this are already solving stuff that we need to solve in 10 years, maybe 15 years. So it's already happening right under your nose. And this is a radical, extreme example, but it is true. You can easily look it up afterwards. Uh, we will share through a CFO events website the links of all everything you see. And you can just link with them and talk to them and invite them over. So what are you doing? I mean, we're making gold abundant instead of scarce. I think it's cool. So, let's get down to Earth. Um, who of you have heard of the uh, material called graphene already? Not everyone. So, graphite, you all know graphite. It's in your pencil, it's the black stuff. And if you take a piece of tape, and you put a, a line, you draw a line on it, you put another tape, you put it on top of it, and you would extract it very careful, you get a very thin layer of graphite. It's called graphene. And it has, uh, it's a supermaterial, like they call it. And it has very interesting aspects. It's uh, almost as hard as diamond. It's bendable and flexible. And it's a supercapacitor. And this is very, very important, because we need to rethink, redesign batteries. So with a, graph uh, a graphene uh, 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 battery, you could, st uh, could charge your cell phone in only two seconds. Not half an hour, two seconds. Bleep, done. They are putting this right now in cars. So if you put this in the battery of your car, you could charge your car in only five minutes. This is a big game changer in logistics, automotive, distribution, and in all the devices that we use that need power. So if we can solve the storage of power easily, the world is already changing dramatically. And this is happening right now under your nose, and you can look them up. And amateurs and experts are working on this. This is graphic. There's another one called perovskite. Perovskite, they pu they're putting it in solar panels. So uh, the effect uh, uh, um, uh, of uh, solar panels uh, is, uh, is uh, increasing tremendously because of stuff like this. Um, anyone here in the room is allergic for certain types of food? No? Okay, you? Okay, maybe you have a nut allergy. And if you're having dinner and, there, and you're allergic to nuts and there's nuts in your food, you're, you're going to die somehow or you end up in hospital. This is one of the interesting things that is already on the market. It's 120 euros. It's the SKIO. It's a spectrometer who's measuring the molecular radiation of any material. This is deep learning, sensor technology, algorithms, design, uh, um, um, uh, conflagrated into one device of 120 euros. If you aim this at your plate, it will warn you if there are nuts in your food. It's a game changer. It's already for sale, 120 euros. But the next iteration of this, and they're already working on it, will be better, cheaper, more accurate, more capable. 
And uh, if you aimed it at your plate or at an apple, it will tell you how many calories uh, there are in it. So if you were in the field of health, or sports, of obesitas, it's a radical game changer. But the fifth iteration of this thing is invisible. Not because I believe in invisibility, but because of all the parts of it are so small that it's actually in your smartwatch, like your Apple Watch or all the competitors that will show up. This, so this is, right, this is science fiction happening right now. Are there any Trekkies here in the room? Star Trek fans, very well. Uh, well, in Star Trek there is a device, it's called the Tricorder. Uh, it's, it's a device that can track everything and measure everything. And there was this uh, worldwide uh, competition to build the world's first tricorder. Well, gentlemen, I have it here. This is actually the first tricorder in the world. They won the prize. It's the Scanner Do Scout. It's uh, 140 euros, full of technology. You put it on your head. In only two minutes, it will compu computize uh, 26 vital body functions. So the main reason to go to a doctor is gone because then uh, this, uh, this little device will find out. The next one will be more beautiful, smaller, cheaper, more accurate, and, well, you can store the data or delete it. And if you store it, you can share it or not share it. And if you share it, you can share it anonymously, not anonymously, or with only people with the same disease as you have. So the data set that will come out of devices like this will be 10,000 times bigger and all the data that all the pharmaceuticals have all together. So this is unprecedented in history. So if you're in the pharmaceutical business, you will be out of business. Um, and this will solve uh, things on mankind level. Is there anyone here in the room who ever got uh, to a hospital to make a, a, a heart film? Is that good English, by the way? Heart film? Do you call it in English? Heart film? A film of your heart pattern. ECG. Easy, easy, uh, oh yeah, ECG. It's here. <laughs> Okay, well, I don't know how the system uh, with health works in South Africa, but in the Netherlands, if you want to make an ECG, you ha first have to phone your, uh, uh, the, your doctor. So you first speak to the assistant, then you go to the doctor, then they will send you to a hospital if you're in trouble. And then there's a guy of the security, then a receptionist, then you, uh, you're going to another department in the hospital, another receptionist, and then the assistant, and then the doctor, and some people behind the scenes are doing administration and bills and secure, uh, insurance and stuff like that. So to make even one ECG, 10 or 15 people are involved. In the Netherlands, um, the biggest part of the national product goes to health. 80 billion euros a year goes to health. This is why money of education is gone, because we are putting it in health. And Mr. Einstein always said, you cannot solve a problem with the same type of thinking that originally created the problem. So a solution in the field of health won't come from the government or from people in the health business. This device here is only 75 euros. And if you put it in your hands, like this, it will make an ECG in only two minutes' time. FDA approved, highest medical standards on the world. One problem, <laughs> I cannot interpret it. So it will send a movie to uh, my iPhone and then, oh, no idea. <laughs> because it takes a year of study, uh, medical training, to understand an ECG. But that's not a problem. So I could give this to my doctor and say, okay, here's this thing, it's only 75 euros. So if I would give this to my doctor, it already saves a lot of work for 10 or 15 other people. In the, I don't have to go to a hospital. But <laughs> in the app, there's a button that says, I have no idea. You push it, and then 20,000 uh, 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 um, uh, um, uh, doctors in training will see this, and they have to study uh, ECGs. And if 200 of them have the same conclusion, on average, well, then this is the solution. <laughs> but this is already happening now. So the fifth iteration of this will have deep learning algorithms, a bigger data set, and is interconnected, so you don't even need that button. This device will know it and, uh, uh, what to do. So this will cost a lot of work. A lot of people will lose their jobs because of innovations like this. And you cannot do anything against it. And I think this is good news on a mankind level. Um, so, and this is one of the biggest uh, threats or opportunities, it's a perspective question, um, uh, of mankind. It's IBM Watson. On American television, for years there was running this TV quiz called Jeopardy. And you have to be a bit witty for it. You have to understand the semantics of the question. It's not like a quiz where you can say, which country is left of France, or which, uh, how high is the Eiffel Tower? 
the, que the questions in this Jeopardy uh, TV show are more difficult. And what they did is they took IBM Watson, a big supercomputer of IBM, and they said to the computer, you have to memorize the whole Wikipedia and you have to compute uh, ties and calculate all the uh, internal links in Wikipedia to understand what uh, the world is about. And then they put Watson on national TV together with the two best uh, um, um, champions on Jeopardy ever, two white males in the 50s. And it was very funny. You should look up uh, the, the YouTube movie about it and turn off the, the sound. And then you see the faces of those guys. And then you see, oh, yeah. And you see, oh, they know the answer. OK. And then something like this happened. Oh. Because uh, Watson already knew the same answer as the guys, but it's a computer, so it can push a button faster than the motorics of uh, those 250 uh, uh, white males. Uh, so um, the computer has won. This was very big news for mankind and in computing history. What people cannot f uh, uh, envision is that computing power in 10 years' time, because of exponentiality, is not 10, 10 times or 1,000 times bigger. Computing power in 10 years will be a million times faster and better. Cheap, available to 4 billion people on the planet. So in 10 years' time, it's easy for uh, uh, the predecessor of IBM, the Watson, to uh, memorize all the laws, all the verdicts, all the reactions in the media, to teach, uh, talk with an expert panel of 1,000 experts on that topic. The big money in law is being made not by the guys with the high tariffs on top of the game. It's, it's made by all the, the, the guys and girls who are uh, dealing with uh, information, fiddling with it, and trying to look it up and doing research. In 10 years' time, it will be free and will be done in a few seconds. Is there anyone in the room here who is making money with auditing? I mean, if you're making one, an audit, it's nothing like a strict set of rules of how to comply with law and everything. So you program, you can already do this. You can program an algorithm that, that, that figures out, okay, what is the deal here? You connect it with your, uh, your uh, data set, and it will figure out everything that is not normal. And then you dive into that as well. So if you're in the auditing business, uh, things that are happening in this field will make your business obsolete. This is one of the things why I think that the future of the branch finance is at stake, and I don't know if it's good or bad news is. Maybe you can use all your intelligence and intellect on other stuff. But uh, this is happening right now under your nose. When we look at the world of finance, uh, well, I want to quote Bill Gates here. He, he once said, the world not, doesn't need banks. The world needs banking. And uh, the best solution in any field always comes from another field. So I think the future of banking won't be coming from the world of banks, because they cannot innovate fast enough. So you've all heard of Bitcoin, and maybe you laugh about it, maybe you don't take it seriously, but the fifth or the sixth iteration of the blockchain will solve the open ledger problem and the security. So bank transactions, you cannot make money with that anymore, already not, but they will, then you will be out of business. And Apple, well, if Apple would be a bank, they would have the highest approval rates on Earth. They have 800 million users who are very and extremely satisfied with the services of Apple. I'm not saying Apple is a nice company, I'm saying they're very good at use, uh, uh, customer satisfaction. And it's only a matter of time when worldwide Apple Pay is the dominant payment platform, but now they use, they piggyback on the infrastructure of the big banks. But once the blockchain is done and ready and finished and more improved, they could easily step over and then they don't have 800 million customers, but 1.6 billion customers. So Apple is eating your lunch already. So everything that can be digital will be digital. We've seen it with pictures, with music, with video, and so on. So everything that can be digital will be digital. And everything that is digital, you could copy it millions of times without extra costs. Interesting dynamics leading to a world of abundance. I rarely hear people talk about an issue that I want to address right now. Um, in every smartphone, even the ones of 100 euros, there is a phone, obviously. There's a camera, a video camera, a photo camera. There are books in it, a uh, word for it, like Scrabble, uh, a payment system, a calculator, uh, um, a flashlight. So in my phone, there are at least 80,000 euros worth of stuff. 
can you imagine that there are 80,000 years worth of stuff is lying here, materialized, like a calculator, a dictaphone, a photo camera? For this stuff, to make it, we needed raw material. We needed machines. We needed people to, 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 uh, to, to, to deal with the machines, to get the stuff out of the soil. And we needed transport. We needed finance. We needed security. We needed uh, labor condition. We needed laws. We need people to assemble it, to sell it on the market, and then we have to produce it, and then we have to pack it, and then we have to ship it again, and then we needed marketing and retail and st shops, and then we, we bought it, and then we, there was a lot of waste material around it. All this stuff will be gone. In the upcoming 10, 15 years, a large part of the people in the world will think of access instead of possessions. It's not practical to, to store all those goods if you can have them digitally. It's the same with, uh, with music and stuff like that. So this will affect the world in a bigger way than most of the people sense. But there's another angle. Everything that is not digital, thus material, will be better, cheaper, more accurate, towards free. So here's a drone, a quadcopter called uh, uh, the Phantom. Um, a few years ago, this was $5,000. Uh, it's, no, uh, it's, it's not a toy. It can fly up to a one kilometer far away. It can go as high as 500 meters, which is pretty high. And you could add a HD GoPro camera underneath it. It will fly, fly perfectly on GPS. You could, uh, and um, this is insane. This stuff, because of uh, uh, things happening in 3D uh, and algorithms and uh, battery technology and GPS technology, this thing is already just 500 euros. So in three years' time, this thing will be uh, flying five kilometers away, two kilometers high, and only 80 euros in the hands of the masses. Every year, I organize a festival in a forest in the Netherlands. And last year, it was the first year that I was able to, to make a video from the sky. So a few years ago, you needed National Geographic kind of imagery to make stuff like this, but now you only need a drone of 500 euros. The higher you become, then you can see the world is actually round. I think it's very funny. <laughs> and um, look at this. I mean, th those, this is really this is not perfect image because of the, the beamer, but making stuff, footage like this is incredible. What if you're in the construction business, if you're in the railroad business? I mean. You should involve this in your company. Who, who, who of you work at a company that already uses drones like this? Okay, you all should at least buy one. You could easily afford it just to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> Remember, it's not a toy. Well, the, the difference between you, where you are now and in five years depends on the quality of books you've read, said a guy once. And, uh, Jeremy Rifkin, very interesting guy, already wrote in 2001, that's 14 years ago, that we're entering an age of access. An age of access. The network economy, the network age, is not about possessions anymore, it's about gaining access. So maybe you're a billionaire, we haven't met. But you, with all your billions, cannot uh, hear more songs on Spotify than I can do as a poor guy with only 10 euros a month because the whole concept behind Spotify is having access to everything. So, Mr. Rifkin said, we don't need 800 euros a year of our salary to buy 20 CDs. No, you buy access to Spotify for seven or eight euros a month. We don't need 500 euros a year to buy DVD boxes with Homeland or 24 or whatever. We buy access to Netflix or HBO for six, seven euros a month. So this will provide access to millions of people who, uh, who needed money, uh, uh, a lot of money, to buy this stuff, to afford this stuff, but we don't, we're not there anymore. It's, we get, we're entering an age of access. And Uber is about access as well. And I think uh, you have to be ready for dynamics like this. Well, then there's another power affecting uh, uh, the economy and the society as it used to. Well, in the 70s, where we had this guy who were playing with train, adult guy playing with trains or radio amateurs, and we thought, okay, everybody has their hobby, that's fine, nerds. Uh, but nowadays, all those nerds are pretty cool people that are connected. And they are making stuff, and they love to make stuff. And um, I have to clarify, uh, clarify a few things on 3D printing. Um, 
what a lot of people don't seem to grasp is if you have a 3D printer, <laughs> only one guy on Earth only has to make one drawing of a 3D, of a 3D uh, drawing of an object one time, and that's it. It's finished for all mankind. So one guy uploads just uh, the right uh, a picture of, uh, of something like this. This is a, guy, a Lego track for a, tra a train track. Only one guy had to do this. And now 1.4 billion can like it on Facebook, 300 million people can tweet it and share it. So then we're finished for all mankind. If you would buy this in the shop, it would be 8 euros. If you would print this out right now, it would only cost you 18 cents. And it will be 2 cents in three years' time. So I think it's very good news. Is there anyone here in the room who has kids who play with Legos and Knex? Do you know Knex here in South Africa? Knex? Yeah. Okay, somebody solved that. Because you needed two boxes, one for the Legos and one for the Knex, because you couldn't connect them. And then there was this guy who created the Knex Lego interface. He just made a drawing with Google SketchUp for free, he uploaded it, you download it, you print it for free, and for two or three cents. And now your Legos and your Knex can connect. In the 70s, I needed this for Playmobil. I had Playmobil and Legos, and they couldn't connect. But and this inspires, like in the New Renaissance, other people to make something uh, differently. Well, are there any Lego specialists or fetishists uh, uh, in, uh, in the room here? Is there anyone who can tell what's wrong with this, this piece of Lego? Mr. Lego doesn't make L-shaped kind of Lego block. They don't do that. But there was this guy saying, well, I'm playing with it. OK, click. And in two seconds, he created the image. And then he uploaded it here, and I printed it myself with my 3D printer, and then it's here. Biodegradable, by the way. <laughs> Why is this so important? Because I, I can imagine a lot of people here think, well, this is just toys. No, it's not. It's not just toys. If you have an accident as a little boy, or you have a problem with mines, because you live in Afghanistan, and you lose your hand, you need to have stuff like this. It's very expensive to get a handmade uh, uh, fitting protege. And you need one, a new one uh, every year again because kids tend to grow. And there was this father who said, OK, that's not practical. Can, can we not make a 3D printed protease? And he said to the world, please help me out because I'm not in it for profit. I want to help my son and I want to help all the kids that are disabled because of mines and stuff like that. Three years ago, it would take 28 steps to assemble and to print out a handmade, a, hand fit, a perfect fitting protease. And because of the ingenuity and people open source working together, it's only two steps now, becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. I hear about a lot of people saying, well, um, 3D printing will never replace mass production. That's wrong. A friend of mine has a company who's, uh, who uh, has a growth of 30% every month. Pretty nice figures. He's called Brian. He has a company called 3D Hub, based in Amsterdam. Brian says, if you buy a 3D printer, please connect it to our network. But maybe, so you can print for other people as well. You can make money with, uh, using your printer. for. Uh, so you look something up on the web, you send it to one of them printers, and you pick it up. So he has a growing network, a fast growing network of 3D printers in the world. So with those 16,000 printers, he already serves 1 billion people on the planet in a radius of 10 kilometers. In two or maybe three years' time, he will serve 4 billion people on the planet in a radius of 500 meters with 5 million 3D printers, because those are becoming better, cheaper, more accurate uh, as well. So there's this plant in China producing 5 million pieces of a box of plastic, mass production. Now 3D printers cannot do, it, uh, cannot do it faster and cheaper. Yes, they can, because if 5 million printers would only make one copy of it, one print, then it's faster and it's already on the right spot on Earth. So I, I do think 3D printing will replace mass production faster than we think. Most of the stuff that people are playing and toying with is nowadays computing powered. And it's not in an isolated environment, but in a connected environment. And they're using high speed, <coughs> low power, low cost computers like this. L <coughs> last week, sorry, last week there was a guy um, who put a, a computer on the uh, Kickstarter for only nine euros. 
even cheaper and, and more accurate. So computing, computers will be almost free in the upcoming years. <laughs> Why is that important? Well, they're connected with this platform. Is there any one of you who ever heard about Instructables? Just a few. I think this is the biggest threat to, uh, uh, eco to the economy. Uh, who of you has two left hands? If you have to make something with your hands, you're in trouble, like I do. Yeah. So this is the dream of people who are uh, not very practical with their hands. If you have to build a birdhouse, you just look it up and then they teach you how to build a birdhouse. Who of you is very practical with their hands? Who has two right hands? Anyone? No one. Oh, you. Your friends are all there. So maybe you're good at making something, but 30 years ago, if you make something with your hands, no big deal. But nowadays, you share it with video and with pictures, how to build something with your hands. I will quickly explain how it will finish industries, don't worry. So there was this guy, a nerd called Randolfo, and he loves plants, but uh, he's a nerd, and he forgets to water them because he's so focused on his game or whatever. So he took a two-sensor, uh, two-euro sensor, uh, um, a water sensor, connected with a wire to a computer, uh, an Arduino, connected it to um, um, a pump, a box around it. You connect the pump with a straw, you put it in water. Well, you have to add water to it yourself. And every time the plant gets thirsty, he will get his own water. Pretty cool. Boring? No, not boring. Because this guy really loved to fiddle with this, to make this. He made a video with it with his iPhone. He put it free on YouTube so everybody could uh, enjoy it. And this is the list of stuff you need to make it. And here's the list of products, of ingredients. Why is this so important? This is a game change, so look carefully. He, can, he shares this with 1.4 million people on Facebook. That's a lot. And one of those people will say, hey, Mr. Randolph, this is a really cool project, but this thing and this thing and this thing and that thing and that thing, you could put it off your list now because Radio Shack, they're broke now, by the way, but a Radio Shack kind of company uh, has something, a new thingy, with all the function integrated. So it's cheaper and you only need one thing. There's so the community is helping this thing become smaller, better, cheaper, more accurate. So I was telling this to the guys of Philips, Dutch company, and they're into lightning and they're doing healthcare. I said, no, you're not really in healthcare. And they said, yeah, we are. We, we want to serve, tw uh, in 2025, we want to serve 3 billion people on the planet with our technology. I said, no, you will be broke. It was at their annual meeting, so it was very funny that I could say that. And I explained to them what was happening on Instructables, people making things with their hands, and they said, that's not a threat, we're Philips Healthcare. We're a billion dollar industry. Said, no, you will be out of business within 10 years. Why? And I said to them, what, are, what is the stuff that you make money with? And they said, MRI machines, very complex, very uh, expensive. And then I went to Google and I did this, do it yourself, MRI. I hope the internet is fast enough. Yep, it's gone. Oh, there it is. How to build your own MRI machine. It's old news, 2010. <laughs> Cheap homemade MRI machine does a better job of inching lungs. So the first MRI machines that, you, that do it yourself, you can make yourself, are already better than the patented uh, expensive ones of Philips. It's complete understandable because Philips Healthcare only has 300 people working on MRI technology. Even if they would have the budget and the focus with 3,000 people, they cannot compete with 30,000 people on the web. Ex-Philips uh, 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 um, uh, um, uh, employees who don't want to use Microsoft products anymore, uh, Siemens uh, pensionados, uh, weirdos, geniuses who are cooperating on all aspects of MRI technology. So I really think Philips will be out of business because of developments like this in the upcoming 10 years. This is no science fiction, this is right happening right under your nose. If you get pancreas cancer, you're in trouble, you're gonna die. Steve Jobs died of Apple, died of pancreas cancer. Why do you have only 2% to survive this? Diagnostics uh, is expensive and difficult. And the uncle of this guy, I met him a few times, Jack Andrika, 
um, died of pancreas cancer, and uh, he didn't agree. Well, his uncle was dead anyway, but he thought, okay, why didn't they solve that? So, without any experience, without any guidance, without any budget, he went to Wikipedia and Google, and spent two years of his time, his spare time after school, to figure out diagnostics and pancreas cancer. And he solved it. He created a solution that is 169 times faster, 400 times more accurate, and 26,000 times cheaper. So he turned the chance of surviving pancreas cancer from 2% into 98%. So a Nobel Prize, he, will alre he already has that in his pocket, he will get Nobel Prize. Um, <clears throat> he doesn't need billions. The only thing that this guy is thinking of is, cool, what to do next? He's not a lone wolf with a weapon of mass destruction. He's an interconnected wolf with a weapon of mass disruption. He's a guy that I call not an entrepreneur, but a fun-entrepreneur. They don't play along with you. They don't have a business model. They're playing. And they have this knowledge and this power in their hands to, to, uh, to get rid of a $40 uh, billion dollar industry annually. This is no science fiction. I'm here to talk with you in the debate afterwards about this stuff happening right now under our nose, affecting society. The upcoming 10 years will be interesting, a hell of a ride. So, one of the first and most impactful things that I think we will see is the confluence of biology and technology. But I I'm a life hacker, so I love to to <coughs> leverage my uh, research. So I implanted a, a, a chip uh, in the hand of Peter Diamandis as well. So it's the, the guy who wrote the book Abundance. Because if a smart, rich, very well-connected guy from Silicon Valley is using the same chip, he will discover things that I can learn from. So I, I expand my research this way by putting it in people like him. So what to do with all those disruptions and violence? Well, this is the most important lesson. When everyone has access to the same tools, then the possession of that tool isn't an advantage anymore. The industrial age, the age of scarcity, depended in part of owning stuff others didn't own, but forget about ownership. He says, Seth Godin says, it's time for a new advantage. It might be your networks, and networking is important, and the connections that trust you, and, well, doing business is all about trust. It might be your expertise, so you're very good at something, you really learn something by experience, or maybe you even have an MBA. Well, great. <laughs> but here he says, but most of all, I'm betting it's your attitude. So Mr. Seth Godding is stating here that this, in this new renaissance, in the network and information age, your attitude is even more important than your, all your knowledge and your networks. And I think he's uh, right. And he's even more and more right. Maybe you know this term from the HR uh, world, Hire for attitude, train for skills. Forget about diplomas, forget about careers. If someone has the right attitude, and is not too stupid, you can teach them anything. So I truly believe that the organization of the nearby future is not an organization, but a swarm. Not a network, but a swarm. With uh, very interconnected individuals that have the right attitude. And their attitude is something that you choose every day when you step out of bed. And I think this Time demands for openness, open-mindedness, curiosity, flexibility, gutsy, challenge your fears, and be kind-hearted, be nice to others. It will pay, don't worry. So that's the attitude part. But there's the other part, and we started with that. And I think it's your digital skills, because your digital skills, sorry, suck, really. Who of you is on LinkedIn? Who of you is on LinkedIn and gets invited every day by people that you n don't know, but they don't also don't say what they want from you? They just say, let's become friends. <laughs> I have this 30 times a day, because I'm on stage all the time, so it's happening. So that's weird. So I, th we have, I have an inbox with 40 people a day who want to connect with me, but they, I don't know them, and they don't, they don't, uh, don't say what they want from me. Okay. So deleting them all is weird, but connecting to all of them is weird as well. So what to do? So much to do, so less time. But I'm a life hacker, so I uh, solved that. 
I'm using a little program to, uh, to leverage my time on my computer. So I'll watch through the screen. I can't do this in slow motion. So let's say uh, a guy called Brian uh, wants to invite me, and he wants to connect with me. Then I do this, and I can't do this in slow motion, so keep watching. I push this button. Thanks for the invite. Please be as kind to I meet a lot of people. Sorry, I don't know who you are. And then I push send. And then the next one's called Eric. So hi, Eric. And I push send. Hi, Petra. <laughs> so I can do this about 30 times in only one and a half minutes. So I responded to them all. I've been nice. And one third of the people never respond again. OK. That's okay. If you don't respond, you don't want to connect with me anyway. So I got rid of one third of it. And then two thirds will respond. And they will say, uh, um, I've, I was at a lecture. I didn't like it at all, but I didn't want to say it in public. So hereby, or uh, I love your book, <laughs> or we need to connect. And then I can say, oh, gee, thank you, so on. And I, I can say, love. Oh, um, uh, I can say, ciao, Martin. I could say, uh, lots of love. I could say, uh, kindness, regards. <clears throat> if you invite me for a lecture, I will do this. It's always the same information. <laughs> <coughs> and um, who of you experienced uh, that you have uh, a long email from someone with a lot of questions in it? Yeah, yeah. yeah if you do that to me, <laughs> I will respond immediately. <coughs> So then I have my cell phone with a lot of unknown numbers, and I phone them when I have time. I say, hi, Martin here. You have a lot of questions, yeah. What are they? And then I answer them, and then, boom, I'm ready. No evidence at all. <laughs> so this is what life hackers do. So I'm using a little program that is called Tax Expander, and it's only 15 euros. And because it's a program, it can calculate and computize how many uh, 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 time I save. With this program, I'm saving 40 hours on a single year. 40 extra hours to work with, only with this little trick. But I have a few hundred of tricks and insights how to filter information, how to uh, uh, computize it. And I think those skills people have to learn. Is there anyone, uh, who of you is using Outlook every day? Most of you? Who of you is using Outlook, but, using, uh, but looking up smart Outlook tips, how to work smarter with Outlook, at least half an hour a month? That's weird. So there are all kinds of brilliant people sharing their knowledge, how to work smarter with Outlook, the stuff that you're using two or maybe three hours a day, but you don't look it up. So that's the same as going here by foot instead of by car. <laughs> you're here by car because it saves you time. And then you go behind your desk on, on work, dealing with something that is not practical anymore. That's, don't worry, everybody has it. And, and, and in the Netherlands, we call it um, digital skills. And most of the people in corporate structures don't know, use this knowledge, don't know it. But we have what we call the, uh, the self-employed people. I don't know if you have that here. And there are people who are a company on their own. And they, they, they don't intend to build a big company. They want to be on their own. And everyone say, oh, all those self-employed people, they're all on their own. But they're not. They're a giant swarm cooperating together, making f mistakes faster than everyone, learning thus faster, and applying all this knowledge in a very fast way. And this swarm is increasingly becoming smarter and faster and better <coughs> than people at big corporates. So I think in this age, you should work to deal with everything that's coming up. You should work on digital skills and on your attitude. Fuzi, let's have some fun. Um, I promise something to everyone. If you want to know more about this, I, I created a list of URLs, and I, I will share it on Twitter today, and uh, they will be sent afterwards, I guess. And when you go to my website, martijnaslander.nl, you can uh, apply for my monthly, uh, no, free monthly uh, newsletter uh, in, uh, in English, and then I will share everything that I will encounter in the upcoming uh, months. So you could learn from that as well. It's free, it's not commercial, so have fun with that. And Fuji, I think we will do some Q&A and a panel discussion right now. Yes. Okay, thank you so much for listening. We have uh, Renel van Dijk, who joins us from the Spur Corporation. 
um, I and my wife have made you uh, particularly wealthy. Um, and now, of course, to thank our kids for that. Uh, we have uh, 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 Mr. Johnson, who joins us from uh, Howden, Africa. Um, we have my good friend, Aneshi. How are you doing? Good you. So good to see you again. She's VP of Finance at uh, Controlling uh, Control T Systems. And is Anis Mayet, sir, if you'd kindly join us. He's the Senior Financial Director for SAP. <laughs> he works for Oracle. <laughs> it was on purpose. <laughs> Did you see that? Hey? Jacob looked kinder on Julius when he was saying, pay back the money. <laughs> so maybe just to start this way, um, I wonder if we can get some opening thoughts from you guys about what it was that Martin was sharing with us. Just some brief opening thoughts. And, and then what we will do is throw some questions from you to him, start a conversation, and we'll then include the rest of the audience. Is that okay? Very good. So I've got the mic. I guess I will start. Wow, <laughs> that was really profound. And I think uh, being in the IT space, uh, having access to the data, it's overwhelming. And I think to comprehend it, to understand what is it that we're going through, how does one use what we have, how do we enable ourselves for, from a T-Systems perspective, our customers, this is really relevant. What I took away from it, um, it's something that I use to drive my teams, and it's something uh, we're doing relatively well at T-Systems. It's an evolving dynamic, and it's around the topic of attitude. And we've elevated this topic of attitude <coughs> to versatility. So how open are we to what's happening out there? What is happening out there? Do we have access to what is <coughs> happening out there? And how do we channel it in the right avenues to get the best from an organization perspective, but not by losing that people touch? So uh, the attitude comment, the access comment, resounding from my perspective. Thank you. Uh, um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to the CFO award to tell me that uh, I've no longer got a job in 10 years. So uh, <coughs> I think that's what's uh, resided for me from your speech. But um, I, I mean, I, mean I, I work for a company. Our products are 160-year-old technology. It's evolved over the years, but the fundamentals go back 160 years. And we have recently taken on a value called innovation because we've realized that <coughs> if we just continue supplying the same product, we're just not going to survive in our business. And the, 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 the founder of a company that bought us three years ago, I was listening to a speech from him. He's a, a, one of the wealthiest men in America. And it was interesting to hear him speak as well. And, and it, it, he's saying the same sort of things. Maybe not in exactly the same way, but he did a presentation at dinner. He, he, he did this, and he, he showed examples where innovation, where companies had thought out of the box, where they'd changed the game. And I think for all of us here, um, you know, we need to take this away and think about what, how our companies can evolve. Kevin, where are you from, Squire? Well, um, I'm from um, Ireland, but, but, I, uh, but even worse, uh, my home's in Sydney, so... <laughs> Very good. Um, I too am in the IT industry. Um, I've seen a lot of changes. Um, we have to evolve from a, a market point of view on what we sell. We sell products on premise, hardware, software. Now we move to the cloud. I think so everybody heard that word. It's not the future, it's here already. Um, we need to embrace it. Uh, we need to think how we adapt to our environment. Um, and I'm also concerned, being in finance, of the people that work for you because our view that the finance function will change over time. Um, instead of governments, we're there more for a guidance point of view. And attitude is extremely important because that will show the willingness to move in a new environment to support the business, create insight and value. So it's important that you have the right team to move forward in the next century, I guess. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, let me tell you, I love food. So I work for my dream company. And I must say, I'm, tonight I'm very, very happy that I work for Spur Corporation because I do not think we would want to digitize food. <laughs> so I, I will still have a job in 10 to 15 years. Am I right? Well, that's not... We, we know... We, <laughs> 
Uh, it's the, it's the, we will love, of course, because we're all people and social people. We want to get together, like now in real life, and we love uh, a food experience. But uh, if we really look into the nearby future of food, it's not something that you're offering. So you're offering the right stage. You're obviously in the experience economy. You're not in the food business, sorry. But, uh, but you're in the experience economy, and you can make a lot of money with that because your business about, is about bringing people together in a nice atmosphere. When it comes to nutrition and food and how to make food and what food is better for you or for him uh, compared with your DNA profiles, that's another whole discussion. And I'd like to explore that. Very well. I, I'm curious, if I may, and, and yes, I think your, your particular industry has been, um, to say impacted by cloud would be an understatement. One only has to look more recently at what's happened with Big Blue <coughs> in, in the U.S. and what's happened in particular with their share price to understand the impact that cloud has had. Here's, for me, what's fascinating. You guys are in the industry. You knew it was coming. I mean, we were talking Web 2.0 15 years ago. So the idea of being able to access something via the Internet isn't a particularly new one. Explain to me then why it is that South African corporations, with respect, have and continue to, in the, in the main, be caught completely flat-footed by the advent of cloud and what it's meant for are conventional organizations and hierarchies and processes <laughs> and systems and structures that we've not. I want to take his comment and then allow you to, to say something on that. I think... Um in South Africa, the cloud really started, the discussions began probably a couple of years ago. Um, and that time there, it was about what is the cloud? Is various forms of cloud, a private cloud, a public cloud? Yeah. Are companies selling a solution for a customer? Yeah. Does the customer have to buy it a full price upfront, or can they buy it over a specific period of time? Um, there's a lot of cost savings. So as a CFO, do you want to spend one million dollars, I would say, on a project that we're not too sure will actually work in five years' time. Or do you want to spend $100,000 to explore the cloud, what companies are selling, their strategy, their product, and hopefully that will save you costs and time and embark on a better scheme to support your, your, your CEO, I guess. Very good. You wanted to say something, okay? Right? Yeah, because uh, uh, what we're seeing right now with the cloud is something that we've seen before. People think, oh, the cloud, we have to be there. So everybody's moving towards the cloud. But don't. You have to have a playful approach to the concept of the cloud. Because the cloud nowadays is a market being dominated by big companies, new companies, but big companies. But they're all approaching this thing from a centralized perspective. And the network economy is not a, just about access and interconnectivity. It's also about decentralization. So cloud means central. I mean, it's, it's, it's the cloud of Amazon, it's the cloud of uh, Google, it's the cloud of, uh, of uh, Oracle. But um, when you, I, I want to compare it with, uh, with things that are now happening in the telecom industry. The telecom industry has the, those, uh, those masts, the, 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 um, the transmitters, and they're still a centralized perspective. When you look at an app like FireChat, you, you use your phone as a transmitting device to yours, and he will connect with yours, so you create a mesh. So it's, it's crowd-enabled new technology without a central node and somebody who's making money. So I think cloud now is a business strategy, and that's okay, from big companies, but it will evolve in something that is more mashy, ma not messy, but mashy, uh, and interconnected with the people. So your data is, all, uh, is on a lot of places at the same time, but not necessarily with a cloud provider. Me here. So here's, here's where I'm conflicted. I don't know if you guys are hearing what I'm hearing. So you're saying that the, the, the approach of centralization is not the correct approach. If, if but, it's your only strategy and your only approach, you're going to die. But here's the thing, though. We're all here, C-suite executives, who, in essence, are trying to do a set of things, not least amongst which is manage risk in organizations. If I can't manage risk, right, then really there's a huge part of my function which is redundant. I cannot manage risk of things I don't control, and I can't control things that are not centralized. So if yeah. you say to me, decentralize... So you have to learn to dance with risk, and you have to understand that risk is just a normal part of living on this planet. 
So you have to, uh, to, to, if you try to control everything, you cannot control anything uh, at all. It's, it's just like uh, a mental state. You think you're in control and something happens and you're suddenly out of control. Uh, I know you disagree, so tell him, tell him. <laughs> 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 tell him, yeah, yeah. Uh, Boosty, you know we go way back, right? <laughs> but I, I'm with you on this point and I think there's a more pervasive topic around it, which is the topic around change. I, I know as a CFO, and, and you will agree with me, when your colleagues, when your CIOs come to you and talk to you about legacy systems and the evolution of that, you've got to move away from it, and there's smarter, more application ways, automated ways of doing things. Well, we ask for the budget, we ask for some background, but this is really a deeper topic. It is the cross-pollination of all this information, whether it's currently centralized, but moving to a decentralized model, having the information in a form and in a way that's meaningful from a filtering perspective. Application of it, for me, is a theme here. And I think to move from that legacy model to the new way, which we all don't know yet, we expect where it's going, we know it's dynamic, we know it's evolving, we know we're missing out if we're not getting on the ship. So but that's going to be limiting. I know, uh, there's a story about this guy I know, he's 27 years old, he's a nerd, he's living with his mom on, on, the, on, the, on the attic. And he's a programmer. And so we, there was 7 million euros of public money invested in a project that lasted four years. And he created something better in only three days for only 17,000 euros. So that's four years and 7 million uh, euros budget versus, uh, versus uh, uh, one weekend programming, 17,000. So this is the new reality. Things like this are happening, and what I want to advise to everyone is to see this, uh, try to approach all those developments and all those opportunities as your plan B strategy. So try to do what you're doing, and you're obviously good at that, otherwise you wouldn't be here or even get an award. But I, I think you need a plan B to discover what's happening in that field. And it's not so expensive anymore as everyone thinks to organize stuff in a different way. But it's a different uh, paradigm uh, uh, when it comes to the approach of organizing stuff. Renel, tell him. <laughs> we don't agree with this, <laughs> naturally. I actually do agree with <laughs> 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 I'm on my own here. <laughs> <laughs> but what are your thoughts on, 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 on this entire concept around it's not you, you Ownership, that's important, but usage, and I mean, this, these are, I don't know if I'm the only one battling with it, but guys, these are radical <coughs> ideas. It's a, it's a radical rethink of... Well, maybe, it's maybe a sense wrong sense. word. It's a practical no, hold strategy. On. Here's my thing on it. What you're suggesting, if it is true, and we met today, we spent an hour together, I still say, if it is true, what you're suggesting is a fundamental rethink on everything business schools have been teaching for the past two centuries. So it's not a coincidence that this book on exponential organization is the highest uh, rated management book ever on Amazon. We're now on the verge of these new developments. Kodak had 150,000 uh, 150, people working for them. They were out of business and then we had Instagram valued at 14 billion with only four, uh, 14 people on the payroll. This is new reality, wake up. It's not even distributed, uh, distributed yet uh, amongst all the boardrooms, but it's because it's not on their focus list. <laughs> I watched a uh, video this afternoon of a chain of Chinese sushi restaurants where they don't have any waiters, and they have sushi belts in the shape of an E so that it can serve more people. So the sushi moves in the shape of an E. It serves more people. If the people at the table, the customers, if they want to order something that's not on the belt, there's a device that looks like an iPad and they punch in the numbers and the order comes from the kitchen via a fast, like a shoot thing and there's no interaction. There isn't even a chef. It's all done by machines. But my question to you is, you said we're in the entertainment business, in the experience business. Yeah. What's gonna happen with personal interaction? What's gonna, are we, are we all just going to, I don't know, what's gonna happen with personal interaction? It will become more fun because uh, we're now uh, also at the beginning of virtual reality becoming normal. So uh, I could eat at home and pay 
to, uh, to eat in a virtual reality world at your location. So you sell out great locations together, and then we could have dinner while we're on uh, this, uh, uh, several different continents. Uh, and now you laugh, and that's okay, but my mom is still in Europe, and now she can FaceTime with me or with my little uh, baby because of technology. So I don't agree that technology is pushing people away from each other. It's also connecting people more and more with each other. And uh, it's, it's two sides of the same medal. I'm going to, one, one final note, and then we'll open up to the panel. You made an interesting point. You made it again when we spent time this afternoon, which is, at the point of discovery, you're too late. What you're suggesting is that the conventional systems, methodologies, and processes we've used to analyze our markets and to understand a set of insights don't work in the new world. But you're using an old term, it's called markets. You have to think of creating value for people, real people in the real world, solving real problems that they have. Uh, so you have to create value. If you're only in the business of doing business, you will be out of business. So you were starting uh, this discussion with context. So what I want to state is that all this thing that is happening right now is creating a new context. Elon Musk is really trying He's, he's, a, he's a very uh, good businessman, but he's trying to, to do something for uh, mankind. And if you, if you don't want to do that on mankind level, try, try to do something in the, in, the, in the townships with the stuff that you're doing as a company. Don't think in markets. Think of creating value for as much people as possible because you will be rewarded for it. Wow. Okay. Shall we take any questions from the floor? I don't know if it's a question as much as a statement, but I think the point that, that, and you've made it obliquely a couple of times, is that don't stop doing what you're doing now, because it's obviously working and we're all employed, or hopefully most of us here. Yeah. Temporarily, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but basically be afraid, because <coughs> things are changing at speed, and your, as you said, your traditional models in terms of what you've been doing, for some businesses, uh, maybe the impact will be less than others. But for, for some people, it's going to be very, very scary. But it's also, I think, the other thing is it's not just business. It's your whole life. Everything mm. is going to change so much in the next 10 years because of the things you've been talking about. Shall we take another? My name is Dumisani. Um, my company is called Trade Routes Travel in Corporate Travel. Um, I just wanted to say also that um, essentially what I'm getting from here is that big business is dead. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, I mean, if 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 you, <laughs> I won't. if you don't, if you can't adjust fast enough, uh, because you're too big, effectively, that someone will take over from you very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Can I, before we allow Martin to answer, any of us here who are from listed businesses, because of course that comes with its own set of complications, isn't it, sir? You must have something to say. My question is actually, what what if? You, the chip in your hand, or a chip, was connected directly to your brain through, through your axons. Do you think that could be the next big, big step? Um, our technology and capability is accelerating exponentially. Our judgment and moral and ethical uh, framework within which we make those decisions are mm. lagging significantly behind. Mm. How do you see the mm. convergence that will equip us as a human race to not use this technology and make ourselves extinct, which is a real risk if you listen to Jeremy uh, Rifkin? Mm. Um, and how do we develop the model and ethical integrity um, capability to actually use this phenomenal power to our own good and not to our own destruction? Yeah, I got that. Lovely question. Martijn, please, over to you. Okay, when it comes to uh, ethics, uh, technology is evolving uh, um, exponentially, and what we always see is technology is evolving anyway. It's been doing that for uh, uh, at least 100,000 years with, uh, with the stones and all the gear that we make, and it's going rapidly fast. Uh, what we see in history is that after technology, you have ethics and morale, and uh, years later, we have some legislation that doesn't work. Um, so we need to have a debate on ethics, but it's more like an intellectual uh, thing or a social responsibility thing to do because we're uh, humans, we have to talk about it, but you cannot stop what's uh, happening with technology. So whatever you're doing, 
Uh, legislators will be in trouble. Ethic, uh, people who are in the field of ethics, we cannot do this. Well, it's happening, so you cannot stop this. But we should have debates about it. Um, a lot of people who are uh, 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 acting hysterical about developments like this, and you were mentioning a few experts, but um, one of the uh, experts that I believe in, and I, I've been following for years, I've met him a few times, is Kevin Kelly. He also wrote uh, the classic uh, New Rules for the New Economy already in the 90s, where he un unfolded everything that I was just trying to explain to you. And he wrote a response to Jaron Lanier, he's one of the uh, most critical uh, people on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and ethics. And this is what uh, um, Kevin Kelly has to say about it. I should uh, uh, add this to, your, um, uh, to all the links that I have. And he sa he's stating here that artificial intelligence on itself is not improving exponentially. Um, and if we don't like it, we will uh, <laughs> reprogram it if it does something that we don't do. But this is all stuff that is too complicated for most of the people because it's all new terrain, it's all new paradigms. It's the same discussion that I just had with Fuji. Why on earth would you want to have a chip in your body? Uh, because now the CIA can follow you. No, it can't because I know what's in the chipset. So you have to study those new paradigms first before you can uh, have a meaning about it. And artificial intelligence is not like this, this super computing brain on Earth that is uh, uh, making us disappear or killing us all. So we have to, it's, it's like science fiction, but we have to study this first. So I don't worry about it. Um, but I do study it. Uh, chips and brains, yeah, normal. Don't, don't. Uh, actually, I know Phil Lippmann pretty well, the guy from Evernote. Um, his logo is here on the side. And he designed Evernote in the deep belief that somewhere in the upcoming 15, maybe 20 years, it's normal to connect our, uh, our biological neural uh, system with a technical neural system. And uh, so this is why I'm the biggest user on Evernote on Earth, because if it's possible to connect my data set with my brains, oh, that would be cool. So then uh, by that time, I'm ready for it. And a chip, having a chip in my body, to experience the sense of having actually a chip in your body is interesting. And people are pretty hysterical about it, but, but they tend to find pacemakers pretty nor normal. <laughs> but this is smaller and, and less impactful and less risky than a pacemaker. And I know a guy <laughs> who had a, he created a new um, fluid, and you put it in your, e in your eyes, and then you will have night vision for 10 hours. How cool is that? <laughs> it's like infrared. So if you're in the business, in the military business, uh, making binoculars with a night sight, you will be out of business because this fluid is easy to make. So this is the stuff of new discovery on mankind that in the Renaissance, in the, in the, uh, after the Dark Ages, was not distributed widely. But because of the web, in a second, everyone will know. And I think on, on mankind level, we will benefit from all those insights, whether it will good, is good or bad. We will, we will benefit from what we uh, can learn about it. Um, about companies and working from home, the whole concept of the big corporations are based on old paradigms that are based on working with your hands, actually. M the dominant payment uh, system in the Western society is changing time for money. Mm. Changing time for money. And changing time for money is a very bad idea when you're working with your brains. Before that, we were paying people per product, per production. This is Barry Schwartz. I think it's you have to 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 to, uh, to make it uh, uh, to make everybody in all of your companies uh, watch this movie. Barry Schwartz is here saying we don't need MBAs and we don't need very intelligent people. We need wise people. Because only a wise man knows the exception to every rule every time again. And he doesn't mean wise as old guys with long beards, but practical wisdom. And pr practical wisdom is found all over society, but somehow not in big companies. That's not wisdom, it's smart guys with MBAs. And if you're dealing with customers, there are people. And if you want to deal with people, look at your customer service, you need wisdom every time again, not wittiness and smartness. So uh, I, I, f I, I agree with him on uh, using more practical wisdom. And somehow at big companies, there is less practical wisdom than people who are outside of big companies. And therefore, they learn faster, play faster, and create more value in an interconnected way. So final round of questions. Yes? Ah. 
Hoe gaan we met die? Oh. Yeah, you and I, you and I both. I mean, a future, I mean, a future mining business, <laughs> but for now, still firm on earth in, in open cost mining. Um, yeah, I've, uh, look, I mean, uh, for the past 20 years, we've been thinking, and I haven't been that around, thinking of mechanizing mining and, and making it completely computerized. I mean, technology exists. We can have a guy sitting in front of a PlayStation driving a dozer and, and mining. It's, it's much, much easier to, well, safety risk and everything is much better. But what are people going to do? I mean, let's, all, if all of this comes, comes to fruition, what, what will happen? Will you, and, and what, if, if you've got food to eat, if your stomach is full, you've got a nice place to stay in because you can print, 3D print a house for you. Yeah. Uh, what's next? What, what do you do with yourself other than sit in a little corner and think? I think, in 10 years, there will be jobs that don't exist at this moment. And a lot of jobs that do exist nowadays won't exist in 10 years' time. That was his promise when it comes to technology, that it would make our lives easier. And we don't have to work so much. And the truth is, that all came out for people outside of the corporates. Most of the day, I'm not working. Not because I'm lazy, but I'm losing this time to brief, to, 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 uh, to get a lot of insights, to think, to walk, to talk, having conversations at the nice dinners and stuff like that. So, because I'm not in the business of changing time for money. I'm in the business of creating as much valuable as possible. And uh, so I have a total different approach when it comes to business. So I think when corporates are, stay organized this way, they're in trouble, really in trouble, and then they have to work all day uh, to, to make their money. But if you, don't, if you need less money to accomplish stuff because things are being digitized, you can do it smarter and faster, you will get a lot of free time. And I think this is why a lot of people already are doing meditation, yoga, mindfulness sessions. That's a big challenge for mankind. What to do with all those extra time? But it's a luxury problem. And I agree the half of it is called a uh, problem, but it's a luxury problem. But I, you feel guilty. <laughs> then you have to change your attitude. And this is one of my main points anyway. So I didn't want to convince you with a new truth. Yeah, this, is not the re this is not real. It's also real. I'm not right, but I do have a point on this, and I hope you will uh, dive into this information. And uh, I hope you enjoy your evening. Very good. So shall we, if I may, let's take yeah. some closing thoughts from our panel, and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, close the session. It hey, the mic on. is off. Well, we have an extra mic there, so. No, grab the other one here. So. This one works. Ah. <laughs> Final comments. I think it's exciting times, and I look forward to the next 10, 20 years. Thanks. How's it going to work for you? Is it like those family spare cards just with a chip? Is that <laughs> because it's, um, I, I don't know, what, you know, you always forget it in your wallet, so I can just walk in. I'm RFID, I pay. You walk <coughs> in, it's Arford, we know exactly what your favorites are. We can say, do you want your chicken wings or your full ribs tonight? What do you want? Uh, they will even refuse you food uh, because, oh, you had too much. <laughs> I mean, uh, as I sit here and, and reflect, I, I've mainly worked in Asia, but I've worked all around the world. And when, I, when I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, uh, as somebody, you know, uh, working as a CFO in a South African business is, how are we placed? You know, when, when we have, um, what's our infrastructure like? The speeds of internet that we have here are far below anywhere else in the world. And I, I'm seriously concerned, maybe in an African context, South Africa is ahead of the, the ball game and maybe that's even debatable. But how are we placed worldwide? Because it sounds to me like all the continents in this area are gonna just collapse into one. And the strongest, brightest, the most innovative is going to be the ones that survive. So I think we, uh, you know, as leaders in our business need to take that away and, and, and think about it and put pressure in the right areas to ensure that we do something about that. I'll use this one. Um, I think maybe just taking off from the topic of infrastructure, I'm going to spend a bit of time on the topic of connections because we talk about digital, digitalizing everything and making everything work via mobile, mobile technology. And I think the people touch is still very important. So 
to your point from working from home, I mean, many organizations use the Pulse survey. How often do you get the response, do you have a work-life balance? Uh, no. <laughs> and it's, it's more about work-life integration. So for me, it's merging those two opportunities, the mobility angle, the digital angle, working flexibly, working remotely, and, and just trying to extract, again, maximum value. It's not, it's not an exact science. I think it's a lot of trial and error but uh, it's moving parts and we've got to keep moving as well. Um, I think it was very insightful. Um, it's always good to say in hindsight what's going to happen in the next 30 years. I think if anybody watched Back to the Future, this was the year we still have flying cars. So, so it's good to see in 30 years' time exactly what's going to happen with what we have now. I'll be back. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. What we'll do now is go downstairs. We'll be serving uh, some drinks and refreshments. I'll come back probably in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, and I'll let you know to proceed into the awards venue where we'll begin formally receiving awards. Another round of applause for our guests.